Akwaba, 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 and welcome to our third lessons of the story of Pentecost. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me begin with the housekeeping things. Thank you all for submitting your homework. Those of you who submitted questions, excellent responses. You guys are doing a great job. But what I need you to do, even if you visit the class through the Google Classroom, the class is still available on the YouTube channel for the Church Shrine Online. So that's another way people can access it. And we're working on other places on the church website as well. But wherever you click in, I need you to like, make comments, and share. That's how we grow our virtual village. Let people know that we're here. Uh, the more likes and shares in people who are wouldn't ordinarily know who we were, they'll find us. They'll click, oh, let me see what this is about. So share it. Like, make comments. Tell people what you learned uh, and, and how your involvement and participation has helped you. Okay, so let's jump into lesson three. Uh, hopefully you have the handout and the scriptures. Pentecost, again, is the journey of learning to let go of the God we can see. And for each one of us, that's something different. It might be an idea, a preconceived notion, a particular way you think this is the way God works, this is the way God acts. No. Pentecost is the journey of learning to let go of that God we can see. So I should have made that a homework assignment last week and asked you. So I'll do that now. Homework assignment for this lesson. What is the God you can see that you need to let go of? What is the God you can see that you need to let go of? And I can give you a hint. We're all going through it right now. Our whole concept of church, we got to let that go. Because we think of church as being all together physically in the same building at the same time. And now we see that's not the only expression of church. So there you go. I still want you to answer the question. No, don't. I'm not letting you off the hook. What God that you can see do you need to let go of during this Pentecost journey? So the Festival of Ascension, that's what we're going to talk about today. The Festival of Ascension, which most traditional Christians know nothing about. Uh, let me start off just by saying that if you don't have this book, Speaking Christian, you need to get this book, Marcus J. Board. Add that to your library because it's going to give you so much background information. What I love about Marcus Board is he doesn't speak theological talk and jargon and all that. He breaks it down for the layman. So any student of the Bible can understand plenty. And that's a total skill to be able to break things down in such a simple way, especially things that have all kinds of layers of meaning like most scriptures do. But anyway, the, the, uh, the festival of ascension of Jesus occurred 40 days after Easter and 10 days before the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Ascension Day is still observed to varying degrees in some Christian communities around the world, mostly in Europe. So that's why in North America we don't know much about the festival of Ascension. But the New Testament tells us that Jesus appeared to the apostles during 40 days after his suffering. They gathered together one last time in or near Jerusalem. Excuse me. Jesus tells them to stay in Jerusalem where they will soon be empowered by the Holy Spirit and commissions them to be his witnesses in the Jewish homeland and even to the ends of the earth. Throughout the Bible, that number 40 reflects a period or a season or a cycle of completeness that brings about a much needed change or transformation either individually or collectively. Okay, so what are we going through right now? We're going through the experience of that spell called 40. 
We're living in 2020. Add 20 and 20 and what do you get? 40. So we're in that season right now uh, of 40 and going through a, a much needed change and transformation, not just individually, but collectively and not just locally, not just nationally, but internationally all over the world. We're all going through this together. We're having our own 40 day experience, just like the people in biblical times had over and over again. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Noah, it rained for 40 days and for that 40 is always the marker for some meaningful cyclical seasonal change or transformation. OK, so we our evolution as humans is totally being transformed right now as we speak. Life will never be the same again. OK, you can say the cause is COVID-19, but if it wasn't COVID-19, it would have been something else. And we never know how the Holy Spirit is going to wake us up. OK, we just never know. So stay vigilant and try to get as much as you can out of this experience, because it's going to radically alter life as we know it on the planet. So that 40 days. 40 days is the period of time between Easter and the Festival of Ascension, this Ascension Day. And so that's based on the story of Ascension that we find in Acts 1 through 11. OK, which brings me to my first scripture, which I'm just going to read. I'm not going to read the first part of Acts, just verses six through eight, where it says, Now, having met together, they asked him, Lord, has the time come for you to restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know times or dates that the father has decided by his own authority, but you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, which will come on you. And then you will be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but throughout Judea and Samaria and indeed to the ends of the earth. OK, so that's our first scripture. So in that scripture, Jesus is talking to his beloved disciples about what's getting ready to take place. He said the Holy Spirit is going to descend and radically alter you. OK, so the disciples met with Jesus for those 40 days They met him on the road to Emmaus. They met him in the upper room. They met him in different places during those 40 days. And in, in theological terms, this is when they receive what theological uh, seminaries teach is called the Great Commission. They get this charge from Jesus. This is what I want you to do. Uh, to carry on the movement. So they get commissioned to go out and spread the gospel of good news that Jesus was spreading during his brief ministry. Traditional Christians really take that way out of context and add in a whole lot of other stuff that the scripture doesn't really say. Uh, but when he said go out even to the ends of the earth, what do you think that meant? That's your first work, homework, second homework or something. When he said go to the ends of the earth, was that just a figure of speech or was that literal? I'm not going to answer that. I want you to answer that when he said even to the ends of the earth. A lot of uh, biblical style scholars have been debating that for many, many years. And uh, most of them come to the conclusion that that scripture in Acts was uh, added to the story. So that it could represent uh, what eventually happened in Christianity. You got to remember that our interpretation of the story uh, was handed down from generation to generation. Nobody was there. Nobody heard what was said. This is a writer's account. The, the writer of the book of Acts account of what Jesus did or said. OK, but you also have to keep in mind that. There were certain people at the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church who decided uh, to agree on this is what this meant. This is what that meant. OK, so a lot of our understand. I'm saying all that to say that a lot of our understanding of the scripture is what we have been conditioned to believe about the scripture uh, throughout our 
lives. So a lot of times we see things that aren't even there, but we've been conditioned not only to uh, a particular belief, but to a literal understanding. And many, many times throughout the scripture, and we talked about this last week, there was not any literal application going on. It was a symbolic expression, a metaphorical expression, okay, that had deeper meaning beyond the words themselves. So if you don't understand that, a lot of times you're going to take scriptures like that very, very literally. Okay, so when he said to the ends of the earth, he was talking about the world as he knew it. He had never traveled outside of that small circle. The furthest he ever went was Egypt. And according to the stories about Jesus in the New Testament, he went to Jesus two or three times in his lifetime. So ends of the earth, that's, you know, that, that's a very symbolic expression. But anyway, let's go on to the second scripture I want to share with you. It's from the book of Acts. It's the same story, but just another part, the third part of it, verses 9 through 11. Where it says, as he said this, he was lifted up while they looked on and a cloud took him from their sight. They were still staring into the sky as he went when suddenly two men in white were standing beside them. And they said, why are you Galileans standing here looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you have seen him go to heaven. So here again. How many times have you heard this same story about two men dressed in white who showed up at the scene and asked the question, why are you looking in the tomb? Why are you looking among the dead for somebody who's alive? So here he is asking the same question. Why are you looking up in the sky? He'll come back the same way he left you. OK, and again, traditional Christians have interpreted this scripture, misinterpreted this scripture for hundreds of years thinking that Jesus was coming back a second time. Well, if you take that literally, that's not what was being transmitted. Jesus was taken up into heaven as a spirit and he would return as a spirit. When was he going to return? That's your third question for homework. When does the scripture imply that Jesus will return? Now think about the Festival of Ascension and think about Pentecost Day. Those are the two clues I'm going to give you. Uh, but I think the author was trying to help us get the connection between Jesus' uh, appearance to the disciples and what happened in the upper room on Pentecost Day. OK, so if you don't have that context, you're going to completely misunderstand what the uh, intention, what the writer's intention is. And in that uh, third scripture, second scripture from Acts 1 verses 9 through 11. Now, though, most most Christians think of the ascension as an event that either happened or didn't happen on a particular day in a particular place. But the reality is, again, it was a symbolic story rather than a literal or factual one. The New Testament has three ascension accounts with different details of what happened. Two of the stories, the ones in Luke and the Acts, which Bible scholars say were written by the same author. Even those two that were written by the same person has different details about what happened. So while Acts says the ascension took place 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, Luke says that it happened on the Sunday of the first Easter. So one says it happened on the same day he rose and the other says it happened 40 days after. One story says Jesus met them in Bethany. Another one says that they gathered together in Jerusalem. Matthew's version says that it happened in Galilee, not in or near Jerusalem. Now, this story reminds me a lot of uh, the creation story in the Bible, which a lot of people misinterpret as one whole story. Genesis one and two. It's not one whole story. It's many stories combined together, compiled together. There are three different creation stories in that one part of 
Genesis, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, and if you pay attention and read it for yourself, you'll see where it starts and ends and another story starts and ends and another story starts and ends. But this story is the same way. These, these different versions of the ascension are all essentially trying to tell us something meaningful. And the meaning is not in the facts or the details. It really doesn't matter if they met in Bethany or Jerusalem or Galilee. The point is they met and they experienced the risen Christ and he ascended from them in some mystical manner. None of us were there. We'll never know. And it doesn't matter. Okay, so all of these discrepancies indicate that the author is not trying to convey to us some literal historical event, but rather a metaphorical narrative, of, much like the parables of Jesus that he taught himself. The meaning was not in the details. The meaning was in the symbolism that he used to tell the story. So that those discrepancies don't you know don't get caught up on those don't worry about those the, it, it just shows what we know about the bible uh that these this, these are collections of stories that were gathered hundreds of years in some instances after the after the event was had supposedly happened so how can anybody have accuracy how can anybody so even to declare as protestant christians love to do that the bible is infallible there are no errors in... Hmm. How can you say that? How can you say that? The Bible is full of contradictions and errors and discrepancies and multiple tellings of the same story in a different way. Look at Jesus' birth. Two, three different versions of the birth story. One story says wise men came. Another story says shepherds came. Another story says the angels came. Different versions, all of the same story. So you can't say that the Bible is infallible, that there are no discrepancies. These were humans inspired by God who wrote stories. Okay, so don't don't be so literal. That's the fixed mindset. That's the fixed mindset. You can't grow with a fixed mindset. Okay, so let's move on. The third scripture is from Luke chapter 24 verses 50 to 53 where it says then he took them out as far as the outskirts of Bethany and raising his hands he blessed them now as he blessed them he withdrew from them and was carried up to heaven they worshiped him and then went back to Jerusalem full of joy and they were continually in the temple praising God. So here again, that's the ascension. One story says he blessed them before he left. He laid hands on them. Uh, and then they rejoiced, celebrated, went back to the temple praising God. And I'm sure sharing their joy with their brothers and sisters. So that, that's Luke's account of the story. And I'm going to have to stop right there and pick it up in part two. Okay. So, again, I thank you for joining. Uh, if you're still trying to get in the class and you're not in Google Classroom, you need to create a Gmail account and send it to me. And then I can put you in the Google Classroom. I'll see you on the other side. Thank you.